Um, so again, I'll, I'll, I'll try to pause every few slides in case someone needs to chime in or, or you know, Ethan can scan the, the waiting room and the, um, the chat line. And, and I'm not a house sparrow expert, so uh, some of you probably know more about this bird than I do. And, and please feel free to share your knowledge with the rest of us along with your questions. Um, and we're starting the series again at a time where our normal has been turned upside down and it, it helps to look for some of these kind of silver linings in a crisis. And to me, the, the global events uh, present kind of this cool opportunity to, to really know your backyard, no matter how big it is. And if, if you don't have a backyard, you, you may have a neighborhood park or maybe a window uh, you can look out of into the natural world. Uh, in this context, we have the opportunity to really get to know the wildlife uh, just outside our places of residence and the wildlife you likely see every day, uh, but probably doesn't register much in your psyche. Um, so we're going to take a much closer look at the common species. Uh, you probably don't really know, and in doing so, we're going to uh, reveal some truly extraordinary stories uh, about our ordinary neighbors. Uh, and this, this concept is captured well by the journalist Adam Dunn, who said, why do we love what is rare and despise what is all around us? Um, so I'm going to be telling the story about a particular species of bird, and, and of course I'm telling this story through the lens of Western scientists, and the story could be told, of course, from many other perspectives, uh, and it would sound quite different. Um, but the man who had the biggest influence in how we tell our stories is this man, Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish botanist. Uh, he designed the classification system that is most widely used today uh, and resulted in every species that we've identified uh, being given a Latin name in the binomial nomenclature system. Uh, personally, I strongly recommend starting with Latin names or learning Latin names of anything, um, not only to impress your friends, but because it allows you to explore uh, the relationships of animals all around the world, particularly when you travel to new areas and and they might have colloquial names for, for species, um, and, and that can be quite confusing. So allow me to take you back to your middle school biology for a moment as we quickly review this classification system that, that Linnaeus created and, and how it relates to our study organ, organism, the house sparrow. <coughs> so the biggest uh, taxonomic groups are kingdoms, and Linnaeus to, when, when Linnaeus first designed the system, there were only two kingdoms, plants and animals. <clears throat> and uh, modern scientists have bumped that number up to seven. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so that includes things like fungi and bacteria and, um, you know, the, the one that we know probably best is the animalia. Um, and uh, so then the next major group is a phylum. <clears throat> Kingdom, kingdoms are divided into phyla, and if you all reach behind your neck, to the base of your hand and all those bumps at the base of your neck, that defines the phylum that our house sparrow belongs to, which is uh, chordata, which is mostly made up of vertebrates, um, or animals with back bones, back bones. And this separates our house sparrows from other things like arthropods and mollusks, uh, sponges, other things. And the next major group is class, and all birds belong to the class aves. And so now we're separated from the other familiar vertebrates like mammals and reptiles and fish. Um, the classes are divided into uh, orders, and the house sparrow belongs to the largest order of birds, uh, which is the passeriformes, formies, or passerines, sometimes called the songbirds or perching birds, uh, which are separated. <clears throat> from the other groups of non-perching birds, like ducks and herons, even if they do perch, they're not the songbirds, kingfishers, hawks, woodpeckers, parrots, uh, those are all in a different group. And then orders are divided into families. And within the passerine order, the house sparrow belongs to the family Passeridae, or the old world sparrows. Now this is an Im important split here because when we go over our species list on the an uh, eBird after our bird walks, you'll often hear us asking for what are the non-house sparrows that we saw today um, because our sparrows like the song sparrow and the tree sparrow belong to the group of new world sparrows 
which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and then we get to this, our, our friend, the binomial nomenclature, which includes genus and species. Okay, so now we can refer to the house sparrow um, as Passer domesticus, it'll be the Latin name. Passer is the genus, and in Latin, it's the root word for speed. Easy to remember anytime you're going faster than somebody you're passing them. Passer is actually a term given to small active birds, and in English, that word is sparrow, <clears throat> which is a, has an Anglo-Saxon root, and it, it literally means to flutter. Um, and the species is signified by the word domesticus, uh, which means belonging to the home. And, and you will see very clearly how apt this name uh, is as we go through the rest of the season. Uh, so this is the, I don't know, the kind of fun poetic etymological stuff that I love. Um, interestingly, the house sparrow was one of the very first animals to be given a scientific name by Linnaeus in 1758. And he initially put it in the genus Fringilla. So for a couple of years anyway, it was Fringilla domestica. Um, but two years later, they moved it to Passer, and it stayed there for uh, 200, what, 250 plus years. Um, and another name you might hear given this bird in our part of the world um, is the English sparrow. So this is our critter. Um, it's, when you look at it, it's described as kind of a chunky bird, kind of full-bodied and, and rounded with a thick bill and a relatively short tail. Um, but I think the best description of this bird is, is, is that it's urban. Uh, as we look at the vitals, we'll see the, the length of the bird, six to seven inches, is about the same as a dollar bill for comparison. Um, and the weight is com at, at one ounce. Um, and these are the little facts. I love one ounce is the same as six sheets of paper or a slice of bread or a compact disc. And yes, what's a compact disc? Um, maybe that'll be my next lesson. And the oldest house sparrow on record lived almost 16 years, and we know that, of course, from bird banding records. Um, the bird you see here is a breeding male, uh, and I, it's, it is, I, I think it's a beautiful bird. It, it, the, the color pattern on the head is so rich with the, with the chestnut and the gray, and, and maybe, maybe we don't look at them enough because they're so common and they're right there, but the chestnut gray with the white cheeks and that black bib, um, and it really intricate pattern on the black. I, I just think it's a, it's a visually stunning bird. Um, and here we have the adult breeding female. And like many birds, the colors are much more muted um, as a benefit of blending into the nest. If you're on eggs or, or with nestlings, you really don't want to stand out. Um, but again, even here, you kind of see that, that rich, intricate pattern on the back um, and that kind of muted eye stripe. Uh, here is a non-breeding male, um, so next winter you can look for these uh, these patterns and, and really it's just, it, it, it again, it becomes a little bit <clears throat> more muted. They lose the bright colors including that uh, white cheek patch and the black bib really goes down and that, that black bib incidentally cycles from throughout the year so you can you can watch on your birds uh, those bibs get bigger towards breeding season and smaller um, towards the non-breeding season. Um, and then another really cool, if you compare it back again with the breeding male, is uh, you'll notice the, the color of the bill changes seasonally also. It goes from that kind of rich black to that uh, kind of muted yellow. Um, here's another comparison of the breeding and non-breeding males. Um, when you look at these guys, also look for that, just that tiny flare of white uh, behind the eye in the male house sparrow. It's, it's a kind of a neat, neat little feature, a little flare um, in the males. So as I mentioned earlier, um, when we do bird lists and, and we ask for the sparrows that we saw, we separate the house sparrows from our sparrows because they're actually a part of a group called the weaver finches. But if I were to be more accurate, uh, I would have to separate our sparrows out 
from the as the new world sparrows because the old world sparrows are really the ones that are also called the true sparrows. Um, this is uh, as as is with other birds. This is a result of people from the old world coming here and naming things for what they're used to in in back in in their part of the world. And when I say old world, I'm talking about the eastern hemisphere mainly. Eurasia and, and Africa, um, but when people came from the old world to the new world. They started naming naming everything, and and uh, often they would name it after birds from their home. Um, so they named this group the sparrows uh, because they look like they're sparrows from home, even though they're not related. Uh, this also incidentally happened to our robin. Uh, our robin is a thrush, and the old world robin they named it after is actually a type of flycatcher. Um, so. And there, there are 28 species of this genus, the, the true sparrows, all of which originated in the old country. Um, again, the true sparrow. <coughs> um, their songs are, are simple, and I'm going to reserve kind of the, the video and audio till the end because it's a little hard for me to just go back and forth. But, uh, their songs are, you hear them all the time, I guarantee it. They're these little cheeks and chirrups and chatters. Um, uh, and, and females sing, sing too. I think that's a common misconception, misconception that uh, these birds are, you know, it's thought that it's, it's usually the male birds that sing and male birds do tend to sing more, but uh, particularly the research has shown that females will sing often a lot more than we expect. Um, and uh, sometimes it's just hard to tell. Uh, so uh, there's a good reason um, why they're called house sparrows. This is a bird of urban habitats. You go anywhere in the world uh, that isn't too harsh of a climate, and this bird is there. Uh, uh, I think it was Peter Dunn or somebody that says, you know, just about any city you go out in, um, you'll, you'll get at least 10 birds within a half hour and one of those birds is going to be a house sparrow. <clears throat> um, but they're also birds of rural areas uh, and, and countrysides, countrysides uh, so long as there is a house or a, a farm or something like that. You do not find this bird in undisturbed places. And, and so we, we see that on even, in, even within the city in our bird walks. When, when we leave Riverside Park, we'll get our house sparrows. When we get into the arboretum in the forest, we don't see the house sparrows, and then when we come back, we do. And even at Washington Park, which is uh, you know it's a city park with, with a lot of mowed grass, you'll see the house sparrows at the Urban Ecology Center building, and then you don't really see them until you until we get to the, the senior center. Uh, so it's it's really that characteristic, and that name is is very apt. It's, it's you, you need almost entirely need a human dwelling um, to find house sparrows. Um, another place where you can go to not find house sparrows here in North America is to go very far north. So they haven't hit all of um, our land areas yet. Um, and of course here they're, they're exotics. Uh, they're not, not native to this area. It's really interesting to look at their global distribution I stared at this for a while and just seeing some really, really cool patterns. Um, and first of all, you can see how successful the species has been uh, in dispersing beyond its native habitat, which is shown in green, um, to other parts of the world, which are shown in yellow. Um, when I first looked at this map, my eye was drawn to a few things. First of all, it's really cool. Um, uh, it, well, it's cool to see that the range in northern Africa follows the Nile River. Um, from an interesting and, and habitat point of view. But then, you know, notice what, what, what does this bird have against Italians? It's everywhere except uh, it's not in Italy. Um, and, uh, and look at Western Australia, it's, it's, it's not there. And, and that I assumed was, was due to, to, to habitat, but in Italy, uh, the case is that there's an Italian sparrow, which is a close relative to the house sparrow that holds a, a competitive edge. And so, the house sparrow just doesn't get in there because this closely related Italian sparrow is already there. Um, and so it outcompetes the house sparrow in its native range. In an, but in Australia, the western half of the country has very strict control methods for this invasive bird. Um, 
and they kill off any populations that start to gain a foothold. Uh, whereas in, in the eastern part of the country, they don't have these measures in places. And I really have to kind of bite my tongue to think about the current situation that we have with uh, controlling things. But uh, I, I'll leave that, that for later. Um, so they're just, they're, they're killed in Western Australia. Um, and, you know, in, in almost every part in yellow, there are not protections for this bird. So uh, they're, they're not protected by migratory bird or native uh, bird protections. Um, so there's really nothing, you, you, you can do whatever you want with the house sparrows on your property. But maybe you'll think a little bit differently as we go through this. Um, uh, another couple of interesting things is that the adult sparrows rarely move more than a mile or two from their birth site. Um, I know one of our volunteers, Robin, really wants to do a study of uh, color banding the birds at, at, in, in her yard, which we're really excited to do. Um, but they, they, they really don't move very far from their, their home site. And there's no migration or sig significant dispersal other than uh, a case I'll talk, to, talk about at the end. The, that's amazing when you think how quickly they spread across the world without having um, large tendency, tendencies for dispersal or, or migration. Um, the other kind of cool fact is that house sparrows as a global species now uh, within the species follows Bergman's rule. Um, and Bergman's rule is a, is a pattern that dictates that, and usually this is between species. So the, the farther north or south you go, um, and they really focus on north, animals tend to be bigger. So within the bears, the biggest bears are found farther north, um, the polar bears and the grizzly bears. And then as you go farther south, the black bears, which go farther south, and, and, and some of the, the South American the spectacle bear are a lot smaller. Uh, you also see that pattern well in rabbits and hares. When you go to the Arctic, the, the, the rabbits or the hares are, are bigger. Um, than, than our rabbits and um, you know it, the, the explanation of that is that larger organisms are able to better retain heat when you look at the surface area to volume um, so they're better suited to these harsh cold environments but because we have this bird that is spread around the world within that species where it, they, they notice that birds in the far north are bigger uh, than their relatives closer to the equator. We have a question from the audience. All right. Someone asked, uh, why are house sparrows not in the Yucatan Peninsula? Why do you think? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, it's an excellent question. Uh, and, and we'll definitely look this up uh, together and, and figure it out. Um, again, they, they can't, there are some environments that they can't go into because they're just too harsh. Um, and you know, it, it, it could be a case of, of a, like, like in Italy, that there's a competitive uh, reason that it, it can't invade. Um, but that's a really ex excellent question. And I also want to know, somebody brought this up earlier, that what's that little dot, that little green dot in, in China? Um, so it, I, it, maybe after this, you know, we, we can all kind of look at this and and try to figure out these explanations because there's probably a lot of really cool stories in this map. Um, we could just look at it for hours. It's an excellent question, but the answer is I don't know. All right. So, uh, behavior of the bird, and this is it. Just it just gets fun. If again, if you're stuck in your house and you got birds outside, I, I almost guarantee you you got house sparrows out there. And and you know maybe just take a minute to watch them, uh, just observe their behavior in the yard. And and one thing you, that I just saw mine doing yesterday is you'll often see them taking dust baths. Um, if you have a, a water bath in your in your yard, you'll also see them taking water baths. But they're they're they quite often are taking dust baths and. And in fact, they will defend territories where they, like their preferred dust bath places, they will, they will defend that uh, just like they're defending a nesting site or something like that, um, because the, the good ones are, are sought after. Um, it's likely a way to, to clean their skin from parasites or, or thermoregulation properties. Um, 
but yeah, just e even when I was putting this together, there was this big ruckus outside my window and there were about four patches of dust being bathed in by my local house sparrows. Um, Another thing you, you can look for, and I've seen this only once uh, at my parents' house, but there's some birds will do something called anting. And anting is just literally anting. You're just, the bird plops itself down on top of an ant nest and lets the ants crawl over them. Um, again, this is likely has to do with the ants might, might get some parasites off their skin. Um, uh, in some cases, birds will actually pick up ants in their bills and groom themselves with an ant in getting that formic acid uh, that ants had. The ants, the tax of ants is formic oriate. It's a formic acid, and it's that, it, it, it's what gives them that little citrus uh, really flavor. Uh, some people, if you go to Australia, you, you may, or you can Google this. Uh, probably Google this safely, um, ant licking. People will actually lick ants' abdomens to get a little bit of that uh, formic acid mixture that tastes citrusy. Um, and in our part of the town, I don't, or the world, I don't know of any ants that, that we might want to lick, but the um, sumac, the, the staghorn sumac has formic acid in it too. And so those little berries, uh, you can get a kind of a taste of what it's like to lick an ant by, by by sucking on one of those red fuzzy berries from the staghorn sumac, make sure it's not a poison sumac, uh, but the staghorn sumac and and from you know indigenous cultures both here and there used here they use sumac and there they used ants to to create like tinctures or 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 hot liquids to fight the common cold because they're they're also high in, in vitamin C. So it's a, a little bit of a, a of a side there, but. Um, you, you will sometimes see them uh, here anyway, taking water baths, dust baths, or, um, or even anting. Um, another behavior to look for in your backyard is, is uh, flock dynamics. They're very social birds. Um, and every flock has a hierarchy. Uh, in, in male house sparrows, the, the rank is, is pretty well determined by the size and richness of that black fib. Um, when you start off life, your bib is pretty small and dull, and as you grow and gain experience, that bib becomes blacker and bigger. Um, so it's, it's, it's really like a status symbol, and um, you know, when you study animal behavior, animals do not want to fight. Um, there is a, an advantage of being, you know, the, the top of the hierarchy in terms of breeding, but, but, but uh, so so there is that goal to get there, but you don't want to fight if you don't have to, because fighting is going to hurt both parties. Um, and so a lot of animals will size each other up by, you know, in fish sometimes it'll just be, they'll open their jaws to see who has a bigger mouth, or they'll compare, you know, tail size or something like that. And so uh, in this case, if, if, if I have a really dull patch and somebody else has a big bright patch, it kind of says, well, if I try to fight with you, I'm going to get... Um, I'm, I'm going to lose, so it doesn't. It, I shouldn't fight with you, and and you don't want to fight with me either, because I could also hurt you in the process. Um, but then it, it kind of helps you know who to pick your battles with if, if, as you're working your way up the food chain. Um, so, and 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 what's really interesting with house sparrows um, is that studies show that males attain the highest ranks um, in the fall and winter. But in the spring and summer, the females are dominant. So uh, that shifts seasonally, which is super interesting. Um, so yeah, just you know, keep an eye on your local flock and, and, and see if you, if you kind of see that pattern. And um, if, you, if you can start to recognize birds, it'd be pretty hard, but you know, without color bands, but you can you know, maybe, maybe see if you can recognize individual birds and, and how they're interacting with each other and how that changes. Um, uh, so this bird is demonstrating an aggressive posture that you often see too, as you know, they're this bird and we're gonna look at a couple of short videos. They're very chattery. They're very like, they always look like they're nervous and chattery and fluttery and they're always like, uh, it looks like they're just bickering with each other all the time. And you just hear that in, and the chatter makes it sound like that too. And, and then, you know, sometimes when you, we are looking at uh, these flock dynamics play out, you'll see, uh, 
it, this kind of aggressive posture often with their mouth open, um, kind of the, the wings forward and the tail held high, kind of fanned out. Um, and here's that same pose in action. And, and you do see males and females uh, fight with each other within the flock, um, within this hierarchy. You'll see males fight with males, you'll see females fight with females. Um, and all right, so uh, again, I just strongly encourage you to, to keep an eye on those birds um, in, in their interactions. Um, so most house sparrow food comes from us, uh, usually in, form, in the form of seeds. Seeds make up about 90% of their diet. Uh, this includes things um, associated with human habitation, like ragweed and, and crabgrass and buckwheat. Um, they also eat livestock feed. They eat crops, corn, oats, wheat, sorghum. They love millet. So if you want house sparrows in your yard, uh, get, a, get a house, uh, get a bird seed mix with millet. Um, if, if you don't have millet in your seed, it doesn't mean that house sparrows won't visit, but they're, they're much less likely to visit uh, if you have just uh, sunflower seeds or safflower seeds or something like that. Um, and oh, but they'll, they'll also, of course, eat garbage and, and just anything else that's, that's uh, left out. And that's actually a, a really cool evolutionary uh, trait we'll talk about a little bit. Um, they will eat, I guess, quote unquote, natural foods that are around. You'll, you'll see them eating berries and, and dandelion seeds. Um, and, they're, and they're really adaptable in their behavior. Uh, one, one pattern you see around the world is they, they, in places, have learned that the fronts of cars are an excellent place uh, to look for dead insects. Uh, and, and so you'll, you'll often see them foraging in the fronts of, of cars. Um, they'll also follow lawnmowers and uh, picking up the insects that are, that are uh, kind of kicked up by the lawnmower. Uh, they'll go to, to lights at night that attract moths and other insects. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this. They, they eat insects usually only during the mating season, they'll feed insects to their young. Uh, I think this next slide, is, yeah. Um, so, so during the time when they are eating insects, so it's one of the few times I've seen them probing in tree bark, like, um, like you'd see a nuthatch do or a, or a creeper. Um, so, so every once in a while, when they're looking for insects, you'll see them do slightly different behavior. Um, so. They'll go to your compost piles. Uh, they'll go to if you're in a farm, you know, cow and horse dung. Um, and there is even an anecdote uh, of several populations piercing the backs of flowers for the nectar, which is kind of cheating the flower system. The flower has that nectar because it wants to get pollinated, and any bird that kind of comes in the back door and pokes a hole and takes that nectar out is really defeating the whole purpose of that flower. So even um, even though they're they're uh, oh sorry. Um, this this critical time when they forage um, in, is is uh, for insects again is associated with with breeding um, and this is true of most birds. There's very very few birds that only eat one thing. We'll group birds into you know birds of prey and and uh, nectar rivers birds and insectivores and frugivores. But almost every bird that uh, is eating a plant-based diet will enrich their, their diet with protein uh, when they're breeding, raising their young. Um, so uh, some of you have told, you know, I, when, when we think of birds of prey, we usually think of raptors. And, and the, the actual definition of a raptor is a bird that catches its prey with its claws, uh, talons. So, um, you remember the movie Jurassic Park, the, the Velociraptors, they use their claws for killing. Um, and that's, and that's, so that's the term of raptor. There's also a songbird that is a raptor. Um, if you've ever heard of the butcher bird or the northern shrike, it's a bird that will catch its prey with its claws. It'll kill it with its beak, but it'll catch it with its claws. Um, so that's what the, the term raptor means. Bird of prey is technically any bird that eats another animal. Um, and so technically, house sparrows and hummingbirds are, are birds of prey. We just usually associate that with the hawks and the eagles. Um, so. uh, they nest just about anywhere. Um, 
again, if it's near a house or another structure, so like street lights, it's gas station roof signs, traffic lights, gutters, downspouts, dryer vents. Um, I've been watching for, out my window here, a uh, house there going into our neighbor's uh, air conditioning, air, the side, the, the gap between the air conditioning and the window, the building, and that's right there that I've been watching. Um, so uh, they'll nest in, in factories and warehouses. They're one of the birds that if, if I'm traveling and I go to an airport, sometimes you see birds inside of airports. Those are house birds almost exclusively. Um, they're, they, they, they also have been known to operate uh, those automatic doors, you know, flying in front of the sensor and then flying into a place so they can get in and out. Um, and they, there's even a nest that was found in an English coal mine 2,100 feet below ground. Um, so uh, for nests, um, here you see them nesting in a, a swallow's nest um, in a cactus from another home. And, and then also they're, they're, they're known to nest inside or in eagle's nests and heron's nests. Um, this bird really doesn't have to worry too much about an eagle trying to, to capture it. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's uh, way too small and, and flittery for really an eagle. So it can just hang out in an eagle's nest and build its nest there. Um, but one of the reasons that humans tend to not like house sparrows is they're really aggressive, um, particularly towards other birds. Uh, when we put out nests for purple martins or bluebirds, we're often disappointed to find um, that house sparrows have moved in first and they've chased out the original occupants, sometimes destroying nests and eggs or killing the nestlings or even the house birds. Um, a typical nest is made with dried vegetation and then they line it things with whatever they find, uh, feathers, other vegetation. It's very common to find string and paper and plastic. Uh, I've got Virginia creeper in my house and uh, they, they, they find a lot of plastic in my neighborhood and so um, when a nest falls or um, sometimes it's just as they're building it, like little pieces of plastic are constantly falling from those nests down into my driveway. Um, the, they nest, they breed early and often. Um, in fact, they, there's some birds born this year will attempt to mate this year and that's very, very, very rare. It, it's unlikely they will successfully mate, um, but at the time between the first brood and the last brood, um, it, it is possible that, that they will make that futile attempt, a crazy attempt to, to nest in the first year of life. Um, as I mentioned, they're, they're super social, so there's often nest helpers. If a bird is pretty sure it's not going to be net breeding that year, they will assist in rearing the young of the other flock members, which are often their relatives. Um, and uh, this, this young beauty here demonstrates that it's an altricial species. Uh, meaning young are born helpless and require strong parental care. This is different from birds like the killdeer that are precocial and they ha when, when they hatch, they're, they're many, many birds, many functioning birds that can walk around and feed themselves immediately after hatching, but, but the songbirds uh, are born, born helpless. Uh, this, this slide comes with my accustomed public service announcement to please keep your cats indoors if you can. It's the number two cause of Bird deaths and population declines after habitat loss of birds and mammals um, is, uh, is cats. So, um, but in addition to being a common food item for cats, house sparrows, uh, you have to worry about you know a lot of the same things other birds do. Like even even smaller mammals like squirrels uh, have been known to kill house sparrows, and and of course they have to worry about humans and, and our cars. Um, and in some parts of the world, they're in the old world, uh, sparrow pies are are still still eaten. Um, so, um, so now we, we know a little bit more just about the house sparrows themselves and, and how they are today. Uh, but the story really gets fascinating when you start to look at the history of the house sparrow as it relates to humanity. Um, and, and I've heard some poetic authors, uh, a poetic author say that a house sparrow is not native to Eurasia. Um, in Northern Africa, rather it's native to humanity. Um, and, and the stories date back to uh, a 
cave in Israel where the predecessor to the house pharaoh, called Caser Predomesticus by us, um, is re represented in a cave drawing um, in Israel. It's 100,000 years old um, and possibly drawn by one of the species of pre-humans, uh, whether that was Homo sapiens or the other, uh, we don't really know. Um, but there was already that link a long time ago and the link grew even stronger with the advent of agriculture about 11,000 years ago. And this is where the story really gets crazy. Essentially from this point on, house sparrows become inextricably linked with humans uh, to the point where we kind of consider them domesticated um, because the expansion of house sparrows essentially follows the expansion of humans. And as I mentioned, they, when you don't find humans, you don't find house sparrows. And there are several adaptations that, that came about that really allowed the house sparrow to excel in human habitation, but most importantly, is the evolution of the ability to digest starches. Um, humans at the time were really good at living off of starches, particularly potatoes, rice, some grains. Um, and they evolved a larger beak, a stronger skull, and a more robust immune system. So next time you see that, those adaptations right there allow a house sparrow to eat the leftover crust of a pizza, the strong bill, um, strong, powerful skull and the ability to digest starches. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, that's, it wouldn't have happened um, without, without that, that those adaptations happening around the same time. Um, as humans moved to harsher climates, uh, house sparrows began to evolve the ability for high salt tolerance. So you will see them in very dry areas and the ability to efficiently uh, extract moisture from their food without drinking. So they were able to, in many cases, keep up with the expansion of humans who use our prefrontal cortex to live in those areas, um, to, to think about ways that we, we can live in desert areas. Um, but I don't know, maybe a more accurate way to portray this is that sparrows were kind of waiting for the humans to pave the way for their expansion, uh, because again, by this point, they really needed us to survive. Um, so if we skip ahead um, to about uh, 5,000 years ago, um, five, 6,000 years ago, we see house sparrows represented in Egyptian hieroglyphs. And uh, uh, the thought by the translators is that the sparrow was uh, meant something to the effect of small, narrow, and bad. Um, and we'll move forward a couple thousand more years and we find uh, evidence that the Greeks associated the house sparrow with Aphrodite, the goddess of love, which is echoed later in, in works by Chaucer and Shakespeare. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, sparrows, house sparrows, are used as an example of the divine, um, and most assuredly the, the house sparrow. Uh, in reference in, in Hamlet with the quote, there's special providence in the fall of a sparrow. Um, there's also a gospel hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow, recently uh, adapted by Lauren Hill and Tanya Blunt. Uh, if we move forward a couple of millennia, now we find ourselves in Europe in the 1700s, and um, now several governments are calling for the extermination of house sparrows and other agricultural animals, which apparently also included hamsters. Um, so somewhere along this line, our, our friend turns from this divine to this despised uh, critter, and likely because of you know, they're, they're considered an agricultural pest. Usually they're eating waste grains, but um, in Russia, turning sparrow heads in was like a bounty and it actually lowered your taxes if you turned in sparrow heads. Um, so now we move. Um, oh, sorry. Um, if, if uh, um, what, I, what I don't have a slide for is now they're moving to um, our part of the world um, about you know, 100 years after this. In the 1850s, um, the house sparrows are introduced into North America. And the evidence is a little spotty of the exact time and location. So some accounts have the sparrow being introduced in Brooklyn to control the linden moth, uh, which is considered an agricultural pest. And you know, house sparrows are really good at focusing on insects when they're breeding. But then when they're not breeding, they're, they're good at going forth and spreading and, and getting ready for another big breeding season. And so it wasn't super effective. 
Um, another company you may, may be familiar with is Eugene Scheiflin, who introduced the starlings to Central Park in the 1860s with the goal of introducing all of the birds referenced in Shakespeare to the New World as kind of a romantic and nostalgic gesture. And it's, so it's likely that he also introduced house sparrows in the mix. Um, there are additional accounts of house sparrows released in San Francisco and Salt Lake City in the 1870s. And then by 1900, uh, they could be found across the entire continental US. Um, and then our final story, uh, again, is, is uh, one of the more fascinating and bizarre stories that happened in many of our lifetimes. Um, for this, we go to China and Chairman Mao, whose reign spanned uh, 1948 to 1959. He declared four great national pests in China. Um, so one of them uh, is the rat, one of them is the mosquito, one of them is the fly, and then the other one is the, is the sparrow. Now, in this case, and maybe this is why in China we see uh, that, that little blip, um, and it's not really spread out across the world, across the country, um, is that because uh, there is uh, a lot of the Chinese sparrows are tree sparrows. They're, they're tree sparrows, not our tree sparrows, the Eurasian tree sparrow. Um, but they're, they're pretty well mixed with house sparrows. Um, and in, in fact, their, their, rain, their house sparrows before this event I'm about to talk about was, was apparently greater in China. So, but, but the national pest, he lumped the house sparrow and the, and the Eurasian tree sparrow together. And in March, he commanded people across the country to come out of their houses and literally bang on pots and pans all day and all night outside of their houses to make the sparrows fly away from their nests in safe spots and then keep flying until they drop dead from exhaustion. Um, they also used more traditional methods, but this is some ingenuity and people listened and did this. All told, uh, about a billion house and tree sparrow birds, uh, sparrows died in this. Um, the, the polls kind of uh, held out and they actually refused the order. They thought it was uh, inhumane. But, but the soon the, after people found out about this, uh, people surrounded the, the Polish embassy with their banging drums and pots and pans and for two days, took care of the sparrows in the Polish embassy. And then eventually there's accounts of the Poles using shovels to clear their embassy of the dead sparrows. So Google this when you get a chance, the four pests campaign in China, super interesting. Um, the problem though is that the, after this happened, the agricultural pests exploded, um, resulting in massive crop failures that resulted in, in 35 million people dying on account of this, this campaign because of the agricultural losses. Because remember, sparrows feed insects to uh, their babies at critical times, and that's a critical time when, these, uh, when the pest control is needed. So they kind of you know, really shot themselves in the foot and, uh, and, and caused a really big problem by trying to get rid of these pests. And so in 1960, soon after this, um, they ordered the conservation of sparrows instead of trying to kill them. Um, today, most places, they're, they're a bird of least concern. Um, and uh, we're actually, even in the US, losing. Um, we've lost 84% of our house sparrows between 1966 and 2015. At their peak, there were 1.4 billion house sparrows worldwide. Uh, and today, their estimates about 600 million. Um, which is second only to this bird. Uh, let's see. The, uh, which so always surprises me. Um, this is the most populous bird in the, in the world. Uh, it's the red-billed Pelea. And uh, so that's number one, house sparrows are number two. Um, we do expect the range to, to change with climate. Um, and uh, and a really, so a really just kind of interesting last fact here is that there still is a wild population of house sparrows um, somewhere in Central Asia that haven't evolved to be with humans. It's still the same species. Um, and they only eat natural glass, grasses. They're afraid of people. Um, they migrate. Uh, and so we have this amazing chance to study the wild 
poster populations just from this small group um, and, and uh, to see how they likely once were before, before they were domesticated. Um, so in just, so to kind of go back to that first comment, you know, public opinion changes over the third many times and, and it often tracks commonality. So when they're rare, we tend to love them. And when they're common, we tend to hate, hate them. And that's really true in England where they do polls about this kind of thing. And when the, when the house sparrows were doing really well, they started, people hated them. And then uh, when they started spreading, or started declining, all of a sudden people started loving them again. And in fact, there was a reward by a local newspaper to find out what was killing the house sparrows. Um, the, the, the major thoughts are cell phones, global warming, um, pesticides, and, and maybe the most, one of the more likely cases are the, um, their version of our Cooper's hawk, the Eurasian sparrow hawk, which like our Cooper's hawks have become quite urban and quite adept at killing house sparrows. Um, so I, I guess in closing, um, you know, how, how you look at this bird, are they good, are they bad? Are they, they just are, you know, they're really good at doing what they do. Um, but, you know, we, we, we've kept them as pets. They've, you often hear to them referred to as brown ring rats or flying rats. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's something to think about when you see a house sparrow, you know, snapping a pizza in your, in your yard, just encouraging you to, to think about, you know, what are you going to do? You want to shoo it away and get rid of it? It's okay to, if you want to get rid of them, you can destroy nests. You, you, the Humane Society would encourage you to destroy nests uh, before they lay the eggs. Um, uh, but, you know, maybe watch it and reflect on it a little bit and consider that deep evolutionary story going back 11,000 years with, with humanity. And, um, you know, when your house was built, it created house sparrow habitat. So the same habitat that they've been building for tens of thousands of years. Um, but if you really want to tap into your inner four pests campaign and really get rid of them, um, you can always try this true and tried method of banging pots and pans. So, it, wow, 10 o'clock on the mark. Um, I, I will encourage you guys to, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, I didn't really get a chance to play any videos of their song, but you, you don't really need videos. Just go outside and look at them. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe if we have, have a few minutes for questions before Ethan gets started. Um, but thank you for listening. It, it's uh, it's just so weird to only hear my voice for an hour straight. So I'm going to take a break. Great. Why don't we take, um, oh, I'll turn my video on. Um, well, I'm welcoming anyone that's just joining for the eBird uh, lecture uh, that will start shortly. But if, why don't we take a quick break for those that want to stay and for those uh, that want to head out, you're more than welcome to leave. Um, but maybe we can open it up to some question and answers. Um, to Tim about any questions you have. Um, some of you I have disabled your video because you had it on still and you might not be able to turn it on. Um, uh, just let me know and I can turn your video on. Um, but mainly we're just asking questions now for the next few minutes. Um, take a break, get some coffee. Get in the bathroom. Yeah, I, have a, I was gonna say, um, it was great. I really learned a lot. And I tried to make a couple comments, but uh, I couldn't chat because when I typed something out, it went to the person's other, the person before me. So I couldn't chat to you. I, I could only, my chat only got returned to the person before me who was chatting. So they wouldn't accept my chat then. So what was I doing wrong? You can change the setting if you click on the, in the where it says two, you can change it to everyone. Um, you might oh. have, must have had it sent to the, the last reply. I just right. To, I did, okay. I'm, I'm just just to um, amplify what you said. Yesterday, I, I was at looking out the window and I thought, "That's such a beautiful bird. That just can't be a house bird. It just can't be. It's so white and so black, you know." And, and and then I remember, oh yeah, the the male does look like that, but it, it's it was just stunningly beautiful, you know. Yeah, I did not realize that they changed colors for breeding season and non breeding season. So I never knew that. I don't pay a lot of attention to the sparrows, but now I will. And I'm sitting there looking out my window. I don't know, it's snowing hard here. I don't know, what's, is it snowing in Milwaukee? No, no. 
no, I'm in Kenosha and it's snowing real. It's been snowing for the past over an hour. So the sparrows are eating their seed in the front window here and I'm watching them and figuring it out. So very nice people. Uh, thank you so much. It was great. Thank I want to get to a question. Um, um, that Sunny had from earlier, um, she was asking, um, are they ever associated with the spread of disease? Um, I, I, I haven't heard of that, um, whether it's spreading disease from, uh, you know, bird to bird or bird to humans, or uh, I haven't heard anything specifically uh, associated with house sparrows. Um, there's a strong banding community that studies this type of thing and, and uh, on a regular basis, but I haven't, I haven't heard of any, but um, if anybody knows anything more they want to chime in, uh, please do. Is the, the fact that they breed so prolifically, is that I mean, obviously that has something to do with why there's so many of them, but is there any discussion about evolutionarily why that, you know, why that developed? The, the uh, when, when you get down to the basics of, of natural selection, um, uh, there's, a, there's a strong uh, push, there's strong pressure to have more babies that survive. And they, um, Maybe they just can because they're they're in the same place and they don't have the same kinds of threats of migration and you know all those. They, they follow a pattern of what's called our selected species, which uh, tend to breed a lot, but then they also have high predation rates, so they kind of need that. Mm -hmm. um, versus the case selected species that'll have fewer young, but really invest a lot of uh, right. protection and and care into the young, and then have a much higher survival rate. Sure. So it, it's likely just just kind of that, that force in, in, in natural selection, that that's the strategy they're using. Um, yeah, thanks. Good to see you. You too, Susie. I, I'll also just really quickly take advantage of this break to, to mention that um, one of the other ways that we're, we're gonna be, uh, we'd, we'd like to, work with you you all the community um, is this is a really good time not only to observe what's in your backyard but to research it um, whether it's just for your own edification or if you have you know uh, people in school uh, of any age um, there's there's some really cool opportunities now that we're in this situation to not only observe your yard but but to, re to do research on it and uh, so we're, we're going um, to keep an eye on our website. We're going to be looking at, at uh, what we'd like to see is, is a bunch of us doing research apart together in our backyards. Um, you know, it could be that some of us perform the same experiment in different places, which gives it a lot of rigor, statistical rigor. Um, or there's just a question you want to ask about you know, anything in your yard. But house sparrows make a great study organism, in fact, there's thousands and thousands of scientific research papers published on them. Um, so uh, if that's something you're interested in doing, the Urban Ecology Center will, will support you uh, and, and we'll have a community to support each other to do some research projects. We think in June might be a good time to do that. Uh, of course, you could do it any time, but, uh, but um, for those of you who know about Maggie, she's kind of leading up this effort where maybe, maybe throughout the month of May, we'll kind of talk about research and what makes, you know, Good research projects, and then we'll all do our projects in June, and then in July, kind of uh, look at the data and, and how to analyze it and, and uh, steward it and all that kind of thing. So uh, it's something I'm kind of excited to do uh, to keep an eye on that. 